<laughs> you have, okay, Corinne is engaged. I'm engaged. I'm Let's engaged. see the beautiful ring. Let us see it. Let us see it in its glory. There you go. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. This is on video. Oh. So, well, okay, this is what's funny. Well, I don't even know where to begin. Um, this is too I'm so ghost. excited. Oh, hi. How about there? Oh, my ghost. <laughs> And we are your ghostesses. That is newly engaged, Corinne. Hi. Oh my gosh! And I'm Sabrina. And I'm. Oh, I truly have been waiting. I know some details, and I know some secret details from before because I knew when it was going to happen. But I did I not. Have been waiting. I didn't know anything. I, even our listeners had a feeling. That's what's wild to me. I know it was in the air. But I well, have been waiting to find out all the details. Some people. He informed over 50 people that this was happening like a month or two ago. And I was no DMing one him and I was so nervous that you were going to see it. And you also use yes. his phone during green room or during campfire stories. I use his phone every single Tuesday for campfire stories. Oh and he said he was gosh. shitting himself every single Tuesday, which in hindsight, I probably should have known something was up because normally he would just like hand me his phone and I would like log in and do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But actually for the past, like, month he would pull up campfire stories and then just hand me oh an already in the app. Ah! And I was like, okay. Or Spotify Live. <laughs> yeah. I did not know, which okay, is like impossible everything. to surprise me. Yeah, it is. Well, I will start with this. I did okay. not know that the proposal was coming because in right. January we talked about the desire to get married. And he said, will you tell me what you want for a ring? And so then three days later, I sat him down <laughs> and presented a 30 minute long eight page PowerPoint presentation on what I wanted for a ring. <laughs> <laughs> Which I have seen everyone and it is beautiful. If and anyone ever needs like, a PowerPoint yeah, a this, not that. for rings, a yes yeah. and a no. Yeah, and it was so specific. Like <sighs> do and do not. And like you had picture examples of what you don't right. like and what you do like. Oh my gosh, you are. Well, I didn't think that I was going to have to get that specific. I mean, I knew what I wanted, but yeah. I thought like, oh, I'll just send him a couple pictures. And then I talked to our friend Jordan, who like knew so much about diamonds and settings and rings and claws and the shape of the basket. And, and I was like, oh my God, I'm like really underprepared. So I did like a shit ton of research over a couple of days. And then I went into one place because I was like, oh, I want to get sized. Yeah. And they were trying to swindle me into all these other things. And then these poor guys that were like next to me, obviously trying to purchase rings for their sig Ooh. purchase rings for their significant others. Sorry, my phone fell. Um too much excitement. They were also, yeah, they were also getting like Spindle. pushed into other things. So yeah. I was like, oh, I can't just give this like basic sort of outline. I have to be yeah. really specific with what I don't want because they pitch certain places, pitch things as like an upgrade. Right. So I was right. like, I don't want Brian to go and, and be poor like, oh, men who are just like excited. Thing. Yeah. Who are excited right. to get something yes. for their girlfriends. And then these businesses, which the wedding industry, I love it, but. They just take it's advantage hard. of people. Right. I agree. Yeah. I mean, it's an yeah. easy, it's an easy industry to take advantage of people. Unless you're anyway, Corinne. All that being said was, <laughs> you will not I let knew them. What the fuck I wanted. <laughs> and you got it for me. <laughs> um, and it is beautiful. Yes. And then for the yes. proposal, I actually asked Brian, I was like, do you want to be on the podcast? I was like, do you want to just say the word <gasps> hi? Because he's like shy. And he was like, oh. got really nervous. And I was like, it's okay, it's okay. You don't have to do it. It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Meanwhile, um, Nick is like itching every five minutes to be on the podcast. He's like, can I come on? <laughs> can I come on? Can I come on? Nick, oh yes. You can have your hour. Uh, but yeah, so for the proposal, apparently everyone else knew. I did not know what was happening. Mm -hmm. I people, So many people were like, did you have any idea it was happening? And I had... Maybe two minutes before we got, like, we were already walking, like, two yeah. minutes before we were, okay, well, let me start. <laughs> he said we were going to dinner, and he yeah. made the dinner reservations five weeks in advance, and everyone was like, why didn't that tip you off? And it is because he does that all the time. Yeah. There's always, he, like, he oh, loves there's to a new find restaurant new we should try. Yeah. He's a big foodie. So, I was yeah. like, if he had booked something eight months in advance, I wouldn't have questioned it. Like, right. it's just normal. Yeah. So, then we're on our way to dinner. And I, here's the first part where I should have known. He came and got me because I was working on podcast stuff. And it was like, it's like 4.45 Friday. And he tapped me and he was like, I think you should start getting ready soon. And I was like, I'm fine. Like, we're, we're not leaving. And he's like, we're just going just to like, dinner. Pull away from the computer. Like, yeah. So I was like, okay. So I went and got ready. 
And then on our way, I said, wow, it's so nice out. And he said, oh, <laughs> should we take the long way? And the long way is a loop that we already walk like every oh other gosh. day. So it wasn't out of the ordinary. Right. But I also did think to myself, we'll probably be late, which is, does he know that? Because he's very punctual. Right. And then I think I started to like really kind of figure it out. But I, w- I was also telling myself, like, don't be disappointed if if you're reading if it doesn't, things and it yeah. doesn't happen. Yeah. But on our way, he goes, okay, we're walking. We're outside. We are on our way to dinner. Like, it was like an internal monologue that Wait. accidentally came out to oh, like kind of self-soothe and talk to himself. Yeah. And I was like, okay. <laughs> like, I'm also here walking on our way to dinner. I know what we're doing. Like, not sure why this is happening. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and then he pulls me into the park, which if anyone's familiar with Boston or the North End or the Freedom Trail, um, it was the the park with Paul Revere statue right there. Mm-hmm. And he pulls me into the park. There's no one in the park. Super. Normally, th- there's a million people in this park because it's it's yeah. like a historic walk. Right. And the North End's super popular. And it was a Friday like at like 630. And a nice night. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And he like pulls me into the park and I immediately know something. I, I know what's happening because ah! that was like... I was like, oh my God, Brian, oh my God. And I start doing that. And then there's no one in the park except for two people who are reading the plaque on Star- oh Paul my Revere's gosh. statue. And he, Sabrina, he like drags me. He's backing up. He's like 10 inches from them. And I'm pulling him the other way. And I'm like trying not to ruin the moment. But I, and then finally I go, Brian, there's people behind you. And he goes, don't worry about the people. And I was like, I'm kind of worried about the people. <laughs> just, let's just, like two you're getting so our, close to them. Right. He was getting way too close. And then they turn around and he'd hired photographers. But I didn't know that. I thought he was just like trying to back up oh. and have a, our proposal like awkwardly right next to the two These other random people. people. This, like, <laughs> 200 yard vicinity but, needs an audience yeah i was shocked yeah and then he he had planned for our families to be at dinner oh my so gosh. i didn't know was that like they were all there and then sabrina you had made a video with the, some of our mm-hmm. friends from la which mm-hmm. i'll send you pictures because the photographers captured pictures when he like showed me oh, the video and i, oh. I was like this and then i was like this <laughs> it was <laughs> ugly crying oh my god i'm gonna cry oh right my now. gosh my favorite um, part yeah. is that you thought something was wrong with your family because they had all turned their locations off on find my friends and you thought that you needed to yes. send in like police to find them <laughs> yes yes that is yes <laughs> i always check my parents locations well i shouldn't say always but i use you check everyone's friends. locations i use it before i call anyone because I, I want to mm. see, like, if they're at home. And if they are, I'll call them. If they're not, then I'm like, oh, they're busy. I'm not going to even, like, try and, like, get them flustered. So I right. basically use it not to creep on people, but, like, as, but like, a little preemptive. Bit. But, like, yeah. to creep on people before I give them a call. And yeah. my dad wasn't answering my texts about Mother's Day. And then my brother was, like, kind of answering them a little bit. But, like, I hadn't heard from him for a few hours. So then uh-huh. I went on Find My Friends to see where they were to see if they, like – because also my brother moved to Texas this weekend. So it was a really big, a really big, like, thing for our family. Yeah. There was a lot going on. And I was like, oh, shit, maybe they're already on the plane. Maybe they're already, like – did I miss, like, him his departure? Right. Because I knew it was this weekend, but I forgot what day it was. So I look on Find My Friends. Their three locations are turned off. My mom, my dad, and my brother – but luckily, our friends Jordan and Nikita, they were also turned off. So I was like, maybe it's a glitch. But also, I think my family is getting murdered. I was like, who? why would all of their locations be off? Like, someone threw their phones into a ditch. They're getting murdered. And so oh as my I was gosh. getting ready for dinner, I, I kept going, oh, oh, I to try to calm myself down. And I was like, okay, I'll give it like one more hour. And if I don't hear from one of them, then I'm calling the police to do a welfare check. And then my You're brother texted me. I looked contact. at his phone, my friend. You sh- I should be. You should. I should everyone. Be. Everyone created to be your emergency contact. Called me drunk at like 4 a.m. the other day. And I was like searching her by my friends. I was messaging her. I was calling her being like, are you OK? Like, I thought she was like dead. Where in the are ditch. you? What's I just happening? always assume everyone's been murdered. Yeah. Which same. is why I'm a good emergency <laughs> contact. <laughs> and you answer but, the phone. So that's always good. Yeah. It was a good thing, though, that I didn't zoom in on by my friends because my grandma didn't turn off her location and like they were all here at the hotel. So I would have Oh, my seen. gosh. But uh, well yeah, done, no, it Brian. wasn't ruined. And then the next well day he planned like this whole engagement party. I know. And so it was cute. super fun. Yeah. He had Brian had messaged a group of us from L.A. like two months ago. 
and was like, hey, April 30th, I'm proposing. Come to Boston where I'm going to have a little party. Come surprise Corinne. And if flights Mm -hmm. were not $800, we all would have been there. Oh, my God. Yeah. And so I thought it was happening on Saturday the 30th because that's what he had messaged us. that's when the party was. And then I was, because we couldn't come putting together that video... And I was messaging Brian on Instagram and I was like, okay, when do I need to send it to you by? And he goes, I'm actually proposing tonight. And I was like, what? And so I'm freaking out, pacing the house. And because it's a three hour <laughs> time difference, it's at 3.30. He said at 6.30 PM, he was proposing, which is 3.30 my time. So at like 3 PM, I was like nervously walking around and anxiously waiting for something to happen. I was checking your location. Allie and oh I were God. texting each other. We were like, has it happened yet? Has it happened yet? Oh, oh my, my gosh. <laughs> well, when I FaceTimed everyone, because I didn't, so like Brian, was easy. <laughs> he was like, he texted his friends and said like, the deed is done. Yeah. But for me, I oh. didn't want to text anyone. I wanted to FaceTime yeah. everyone. And yeah. he was like, do you want to FaceTime people? And I was like, like you just invited everyone to like, we're going to a dinner. I can't right. FaceTime everyone. Cause I don't want to FaceTime one person and then not, and not talk to anyone else. for two hours yeah. and then FaceTime one more. Yeah. I like, wanted to do it all at once. Yeah. So I waited until after, but it was funny. Cause when I picked up, when everyone picked up the FaceTimes, everyone was like, hello. Cause they didn't want to ruin it. Cause I think everyone thought it was on Saturday. So like, oh. hello. Hi, why are you <laughs> calling me? And I was like, I'm engaged. And they were like, what? This is 24 hours before I thought it was happening. Oh, it was fun. It was nice. So excited. I blacked out. I don't know what what he said. I was just gonna ask if you blacked out because I feel like I remember when when Nick proposed and I truly blacked out. And I came to like hours later. I was like, oh, I'm back. Yeah, this really happened. It's happening. I feel like that happens to so many people. I asked him though. I said, did you even ask me to? Did you say, will you marry me? And he was a little thing. He was like, yes, of course. Because You probably out. had a whole thing planned. He probably yeah. blacked out too. I mean, that's a, yeah. A he had moment. a lot of um, lies and excuses ready. If I hadn't just like gone with the flow that night, like mm. if I'd been like, no, let's actually just walk straight there. He had like all of these pre-planned things I as to why that. we had to go the long way. But I was like, wow, it's so beautiful out. Yeah. Let's walk a little longer. <laughs> so it went, it uh. went easy. It went over well. And oh, then, oh, so not, I mean, this is about, this is a story about Brian, but also my mom gave me on Sunday, we like walked around a little bit in Boston and uh-huh. my dad and brother flew uh, to move my brother to Texas. But my mom gave me, look, it's this, I'm going to go away from the microphone for a second, okay. but this is going to be on YouTube. So I'm going to go closer to the camera. It's a little heart gold necklace with oh, a diamond it's so in it. so pretty. And it's, I put it on another chain with another necklace because I don't, she didn't have a chain for it. But Aww. this is the first diamond that my dad ever gave my mom. And she gave it to me. And I bawled my eyes out. Isn't that so Stop. nice? <laughs> oh. I'm going to cry. Oh my God. I've been crying. Yeah. There's a, yeah. It was very sweet. So. Oh, love is in the air. Yeah. And then I, it's funny because I posted on Instagram and I immediately text Corinne and I said, get ready for all the men to unfollow you because when people get engaged, two girls, one ghost listeners get their hearts broken and unfollow oh, us no. on Instagram. <laughs> I think you had a much more significant ch- I don't want to make you feel bad. I gained followers. <laughs> I looked because you had said something to it. And I was like, I'm going to like mark what, what oh I'm at right gosh. now. Oh my gosh. I'm but mad. here's my theory, Sabrina. I think it's because women love you. And I think we have a lot more female listeners. And oh, so, so I think there was a larger chunk. Mad. I think there was a much larger chunk of women whose hearts were broken that you were off the market. Oh, man. I think. All right. Well, now I'm mad. Now I'm mad. <laughs> To I like, all I of you out Sabrina, there, this is funny. <laughs> to all of you who unfollowed me when I got engaged, what the Follow heck? Her back. What the heck? Follow what the her heck? Back. Ugh, that's okay. But you did break it's some fine. hearts. We had some um, comments of people being like, "Not gonna lie, I've had a crush on Corinne for years. This is a bit. This is a bit I hard for me to take <laughs> to follow." <laughs> about yeah, so many people, right? Big like, foot, big I have foot, to really like try to check myself sometimes when certain celebrities like get in relationships i'm like calm down like why are you being this you like, haven't even met me like, yet like what's going yeah you're moving too fast <laughs> yeah no i'm yeah i get like i mean 
Harry Styles. It's a perfect example. Oh my there's gosh. nothing wrong with Olivia Wilde, but for some reason, every single time I see her, there's like this, like, like I feel like I'm being punched in the stomach and I'm like, why am I feeling this way? Like she's a wonderful yeah. woman who's going to likely marry this guy that I've never met. <laughs> Have you seen a but trailer like, for uh, don't worry, darling. I think that's what it's called. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. She looks so hot in that. Yes. And also this is like, it just feels very like Stepford Wives esque, yeah, which I'm, I'm excited. So into. I'm so excited. It's for gonna it. be good. Yeah. It's gonna be really good. I also really want to see that movie. Everyone's been talking about. I'm gonna butcher it, but it's like everywhere, all oh the time. Oh my gosh! Yes, everything everywhere, all the time. Everything everywhere, all at once. It is so freaking good. I just saw you it. You saw it? Yeah. Did it I was destroy talk you? About it. Everyone's taking videos of them like bawling their eyes it's out. It's so after. good. I was gonna talk about it in our um in our in paranormal news episode that we're oh, going to record okay, after this. Okay, then save it. We'll, we'll okay. do paranormal news. It's so for, for anyone Patreon. that doesn't know, for Patreon, we revamped our Patreon. Mm-hmm. We have good things on our <laughs> Patreon. Have, no, we have terrible things coming to Patreon. So sorry. Terrible, terrible things. It's going to be <laughs> awful for everyone involved. You're going to hate it. Just kidding. But included in our Patreon yeah. revamp, we have a uh, new, we have like a, a specific feed for mm-hmm. how do i say it Ex- like exclusive episodes basically yeah exclusive so there's episodes. gonna be Ad there's free early episodes. uncut episodes of campfire, campfire. stories mm-hmm. because we do edit them so if you want to listen to like the raw version of it yeah you can listen to that early we post those a few weeks early yeah. um you can also get the ad free versions of all of our episodes mm-hmm. well not all of them all of them from may 1st from now forward. on basically yeah from, yeah Yes. And then also we are doing bi-weekly. So every other week, uh, an in paranormal news where we talk about all the things that we've discovered, all the things that are like freshly in the news. hitting the news. I think I'm also just gonna, discovered. <laughs> I'm just going to talk to about us. books and movies. It basically just random things that come to our mind. We're going to talk about that. We don't have enough yeah. time to talk about on the podcast, but we really want to talk about. So it's just like right. extra Corinne and Sabrina Banta. Yes. Recommendations. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Et cetera. So. Et cetera. Okay. We I'm are excited. Oh, we always are. We're always excited. <laughs> when are, when's the last time we've ever said, I'm not excited about this? <laughs> Never. I don't know. Probably when like I was really in the mood for something light and you were like, we're going dark and Demons. demonic. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> Help me. Help um, me. Otherwise, yeah, we're always excited. Yeah. Yeah, I love the also, demon what's stuff. What's your shirt? I like it. Thank you. I've worn it every day since Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it's a there Whitney is nothing Houston. wrong with outfit repeating. That's yeah, great. no one's seen it. That's the great thing about it. I actually, this is my new move. Okay, now that I'm working at home all the time and don't really see people often, I just repeat my outfits every day until we video record and then I pick a new outfit until we video record again. <laughs> I think there's nothing wrong with that. Especially too because like sometimes you put together an outfit and you're like, oh this looks really good. Yeah. And then why would you why would you wait? Why like, would you just change let it everyone up? see you looking let good. Let everyone see it. Or what yeah. you feel good in. Exactly. I think nothing wrong with that, Sabrina. Exactly. I think that you're a trendsetter here. Thank you. Thank you. But also you know what's funny is I cleaned up my closet yesterday and as I was going through I was like, well I haven't worn this in three years, but I'm keeping it. And, um, I did get rid of, I have two bags of clothes that I'm getting rid of, or I'm going to try and sell and then I'll donate, but it's so hard. So difficult. Yeah. You actually had a really good idea. So we are in a book book club together Mm -hmm. with our friends from LA. I'm the only person that FaceTimes in, um, it's the best because everyone else is local. So I just like sit on a chair on Sabrina's phone or someone's laptop usually. And we set you but up. You had a great idea for the next book club. I yeah. won't be a part of it, obviously, <laughs> but everyone else is going to bring the clothes that they don't want. And everyone's going to do like a clothing swap, yeah. which is so fun. Uh, like I said, I'm a genius, Corinne. That is my new favorite phrase. I'm a genius. Everyone should repeat it. Repeat it to themselves over and over. Look yourself in the mirror. Stare at yourself and say, I'm a genius. I'm going to rule this fucking day. I rock. <laughs> That's what I do nowadays. Uh, you got really intense while doing it. Yeah, it you have good. to be. You have to be serious. It was good. Embrace your inner yeah. love for yourself and call yourself a genius. This feels mm. like the version. I feel like we're nearing the age where like 
Tupperware parties and Mary Kay <laughs> parties would be, or at least were a thing for our parents and like, we'll have some version of it. But I like that you're pushing sort of like a thrift and sustainability version of that party. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And welcome. also our friends all have like really cute style. So it was kind of selfish because I kind of want to see what my friends are getting rid of. <laughs> Right. Yeah. We all sort of dress like at least somewhat the same, have like yeah. a similar vibe too. So it's yeah. easy to get some new good stuff. Give me your cute sure. clothes. Give me, yeah. Just request like, are you going to get rid of this? Can, hey, can I have this please? Just like search on Instagram. This shirt, uh, you haven't worn it in a long time. Are you going to get rid of it? <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen you post in this shirt for at least a year. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Myself. Okay. Spooky stuff. Spooky stuff. Witchy stuff. Tom Wright, our Patreon donor, um, picked this topic. So thank you, Tom. It was witchcraft slash occult organizations. And I didn't, I mean, I I should have known, but there's so many occult organizations out there. Yes. With such intense, rich history. It's it's kind of I mean like a cult is like I guess similar to religion or any other organization. It's just like yeah. a group of people who share some belief, and it just happens to be that like when talking about the occult, those beliefs tend to be more spiritual or paranormal or leaning on magic. So there's yeah. there's a, a shit ton. There's a whole shit ton of witch stuff, witchy stuff, and witchy stuff. it again reinforced my desire to be. Oh, like we have a coven and it's so freaking cool how there are so many practicing witches that listen to our podcast. One, I don't I know, know why you listen to us because you guys are like up here, like, you know, beyond the screen. We and we're just, we're like little minions <laughs> running around with our heads basically chopped off, not Tina knowing what we're talking ants about. Being like, help me, <laughs> help me, <laughs> teach me how to be a witch. So, um, <laughs> Maybe. Oh, that's a good idea. Maybe we have a Patreon live stream where we have our witches join us on the video stream and talk about being witches. Oh, we should. And also we do have, so part of Patreon are Mm -hmm. these discord channels. In addition to the two that we already have public, we have a few more that are private, but one of them, we made a TGOG coven, not necessarily to replicate what already exists for everybody in Facebook with all of the witches, but more for us to like, selfishly you and I, yeah. (laughs) yeah, I messaged earlier in it and I was like, does anyone know how to make like weather rain? jars magic stuff like oh my i want to control the weather specifically yeah. for my wedding day <laughs> <laughs> that was why i was asking but no, no there's so many things i just so feel funny. like it's it'll be a fun thing for us to like all collectively like no one has to already know the answers but to like yeah. collectively learn together yeah and I think hone that's in the our, best thing on our natural about, abilities that i think that's the best thing about our whole community because there are so many things paranormal, witchy, or, you know, mm-hmm. supernatural that we just don't understand. And it's so cool that we can go to our Facebook group. We can go to our Patreon. We can go to our Discord and be like, help me. And there are a, an influx of responses of people being like, I got you. Yes. Or I know someone yes. who can got you. I know. This is, it's my actually my mom's default answer too. Whenever anyone asks her uh, anything, she's like, oh, you should just refer to the coven. Refer to the TGOG coven coven on Facebook. Like all those witches, they know what's up. That's amazing. Okay. But Tom knew what was up with this episode suggestion, topic suggestion, because this was fun. Yes. So I heard about this tiny town a while back. I don't even know how I found it. Um, I just got sniffly. I don't know why. Um, Something overcame me. Um, But I heard about it and I thought it was so fascinating because... It is a town of witches and it has been excommunicated from the church because of witchcraft. Yeah. Where? In Spain. We must go. We must. We must. And it sounds so incredible. And like, and I'm just going to caveat all of this that yes, there's like a tragic, horrible history that kind of led to where they are now, but the town really embraces it and kind of understands that if they don't embrace it, they have, they're at risk of the town like kind of disappearing. So they really embrace this history, um, which I love. And um, yes. Okay. So this town is called Trasmos and it's a tiny village in the province of Zaragoza, Aragon, Spain that has been excommunicated and officially cursed 
by the Catholic Church and still to this day is excommunicated and not a single pope has revoked it. But why in the world would such a tiny town be excommunicated by the church, Corinne? What could have happened to cause such a drastic action? I mean, I can think of a lot of things, Yes, <laughs> but I, yes. I, won't, I won't say it. Yes. I think we all know some of the history of certain religions and stealing yeah. from paganism and lots of stopping p other groups from being able to practice their own beliefs. Exactly. Is it surprising? No. But do I want to hear about it? Yes. Yes, you do. Okay. So nestled in the foothills of snow covered Moncayo. See, I'm so sorry if I don't say things correctly. I even took, okay. I took French. I had a nightmare last night. I took French for what, 10 years in school. And I had a nightmare last night that I was in France trying to speak French. And my accent was so bad that everyone made fun of me. <laughs> I mean, was I that brought that on by this reputation? research? No. Well, maybe. Probably. Maybe. But I was just thinking like that is kind of the reputation, right? Like when Americans go to France, like you're just and the French to people hate speak us. Speak English because yeah, they're like, do not be, butcher our language. Your accent's going to be plebe. brutal. You exactly. plebeian. You okay. Pleb. <laughs> So nestled in the foothills of this mountain range is a tiny town of just under 90 souls with a history of witchcraft, superstition, revenge, envy, and power. The town is called Trasmos. It was once a bustling community home to 10,000 people, but today it's a tiny village without any shops or schools and mostly dilapidated houses that can only be reached by secondary roads. It was transformed by witchcraft and not necessarily in the way that we would all expect. So Trasmos was first founded by uh, or as a lordship in the 12th century. And for those who don't know, because I didn't, a lordship is basically a territory held by a lord, a landed estate that served as the lowest administrative and judicial unit in rural areas. Don't know. But anyway, as with a lot of land in the Middle Ages, there was a feud over the control of Trasmos between the Kingdom of Navarre and the Kingdom of Aragon. And I feel like I'm in Game of Thrones talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> or in Outlander, like just like all the little like clans of people and kingdoms and, right. and power. And it's just so different from what it is. Yeah. It's so different and yet so similar to what today is. Okay, so the two battles battled or the two groups battled and fought over Trasmos for decades until the king of Aragon, Jamie the first conquered it in, t in 1232. So by the 13th century, Trasmos was flourishing and was a growing community of 10,000 people. They were diverse Jewish, Christian Arab residents, and they were finding wealth from surrounding natural resources like iron, silver, water, and wood. But as you know, with resources, it was like a kind of a, you would tr trade and sell with the surrounding areas and some resources were more popular in different areas. And like with many other villages and towns at the top of the hill of Trasmos was an omnipresent overbearing stone castle called Castillo de Trasmos, Castle of Trasmos. And those who occupied the castle got very greedy. The natural resources were not enough for them. They wanted more, more wealth, more power, more control. So they began forging fake currency in the castle and forging fake currency is a loud ordeal. And so to prevent those beyond the castle walls from investigating what they were doing, they began to spread rumors that the castle was full of witches and wizards who were casting spells and making potions overnight. So I mean, they started the rumors. want to go there more. I, right. <laughs> but I think it was like instilling fear a little bit and saying... There are these magic people at work here. Do not come bother them. Which, mm. which is one, I mean, of all the rumors you could spread about yourself, that feels maybe not the most wise, but they did it. I guess, yeah, of the time, probably not yeah. the best. No. But it's also so they hard this to rumor. predict, like, what's to come. And there's been so many waves, too, yeah, in the history yeah. of, like... It being accepted and then it, it not and then it's commonplace mm -hmm. again and then it's not. So it's, yeah. 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 I mean, if I had a time machine, I would go back and I would ask them, why this? So <laughs> they start the rumor. <laughs> of all questions for me to in ask. In my mind, 
<laughs> in my mind, I'm picturing like this big adventure. Like you get like sucked and like wa- waving around in this time machine and put Ooh. back and you like journey across the lands and you're like covered with, like, in dirt. Really intense swelling music. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and it's all like the wind and everything. And you're finally in front of the person you just riding ask, a horse. Just go, Why this? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was picturing. I'm like, oh my God, that's hysterical. (laughs) All right. We should, Crin, this is one of our ideas that we want to do eventually, but we should reenact scenarios that we come up with in the podcast. So we're going to get a whole production crew. We'll do a weird time machine thing. And then it will cut to me riding a horse through the hills of Spain, climbing over the mountain tops. And then approaching the castle late at night. It would be so good. And the anticlimactic so end of, why this? That's exactly why it's <laughs> funny. So much effort for so few words. It's perfect. <laughs> and I only have like three sec- three seconds to ask a question. And that will be the only question I can ask. <laughs> There's a lot of rules with time traveling, apparently. Okay. So they spread this rumor. And as we learned from Mean Girls... One rumor can spread like wildfire and can take on a life of its own and destroy lives. This story is no different. It's basically Mean Girls, is what I'm saying. That was a bad joke. That was a bad joke. Bad joke, Sabrina. No, I'm kidding. You're a genius. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Sabrina, you cracked me up. I had a lot of coffee today. (laughs) Okay, so the rumors of witches and wizards at Castilla de Trasmas spread up to the abbot of Verula, and the abbot was mad. So, because at this time, Trasmas was not part of the Catholic Church, and meaning they didn't pay dues to the Verula monastery. So, the abbot hears about the witchcraft and uses it to excommunicate all of Trasmas and punish them for practicing witchcraft. But naturally, the residents of Trasmas are like, what the heck? We refuse to pay any of these fines and we're not going to repent like you want us to because we don't believe in your church. We don't want to be a part of it anyway. And so they're defying the Catholic Church. And then Verula, they start stealing water from Trasmas, taking away their resources. And everyone's like all up in arms. Literally, they take up weapons. They're ready for civil war. They're about to fight until King Ferdinand intervenes and is like, no, 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 no. Trasmas is actually in the right. Rarula, you are being way too dramatic. Chill. But the Catholic, <laughs> but the Catholic Church, that's my interpretation, of course. But the Catholic Church yeah, was feeling... I'm just, again, I'm picturing like a big <laughs> scroll being opened and it's just like, chill. Chill. <laughs> chill. <laughs> the it's people like, like ride the horses to go... Doo, 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 trumpets. Pull out the scroll. <laughs> yeah. Chill. Your royal honor has <laughs> given you the message that reads... Chill. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I'm so historically accurate with my verbiage. (laughs) That's what I'm hired for. That's what you hired me for, Corinne. I needed someone (laughs) to uh, be timely. Okay. I thought this was perfect. Yes. So again, there's a lot of like, I don't want to listen to your rules. I don't want to behave. I actually want to be feisty and vengeful. So the Catholic Church was just like, Mm-mm. You know what, King Ferdinand, you said this, but mm-mm, not chilling. Um, and so they cursed Trasmas, claiming that it had been a corrupted, that it had been corrupted by witchcraft and therefore was still excommunicated. And a, that's a curse that could only be lifted by another pope and none has ever lifted it since, which basically meant that they weren't allowed to go to confession or take the holy sacraments at the Catholic Church. So they are just like not acknowledged by the Catholic Church as like a place that can be part of the Catholic Church. According to legend, which I'm sure has also been grossly over-dramatized with time, but alas, interesting to share, the abbot of Verula was so enraged that he stood on the altar of the church in the early hours of the darkest night, covered himself with a black veil, and held a cross as he read aloud Psalm 108 of the Bible. Who will lead me to the fortified city? And did you not go out, O God, with our armies? Give us help against the adversary, for vain is the help of man. And with each verse, according to legend, a bell was rung. And then he kept reading in dark, a deep voice, I imagine. And it was a sign to the whole village that this town was cursed and there was an evil spell amongst it. That would be so scary too. Like if you truly believed the curse, 
Yeah. And that's what you were hearing. The, the, this like speech happening and the bell ringing and it's like, you know, reverberating. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. That would be terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, Trasmas really didn't survive this excommunication. They began to suffer under the weight of the ac- accusations and the reputation it had for black magic spread. People were accused of witchcraft, necromancy, satanic rituals, and all sorts of negative legends were spread. And the castle of Trasmas burnt down in 1520, and the future in Trasmas grew pretty grim. The castle was abandoned. The population of 10,000 slowly began to dwindle. And then Spain ordered the expulsion of Jews in 1492, followed by expulsion of Muslims. And then, you know, now with urbanization, it just basically kind of dwindled. The shops were left empty houses grew dilapidated until the town dwindled in size and all that were left left were less than a hundred people. A recent article that I read actually put the residents at a total of 62 currently today and only half of them live in Trasmods permanently. 62. And don't wait and only half of them live there? Permanently. Yeah. Wow. Oh my God. Which actually That's so tiny. A town like that might be your dream. I feel like it's you would thrive a in a tiny. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Sign me up. Sign me up. I'll well, learn Spanish. Yeah. I feel like you have a um, well, I only I think that because Lainey lived in Spain for so long. So I feel like you Lainey speak still Spanish. lives in Spain. Yeah. My there cousin is fluent in Spanish and there we go. Lives in Spain and has for Five years. Why don't you go visit? You should go to Trasmos with her. Well, no, come with me. Why would I, I ever say go somewhere without me? Why would I ever you say can that? Come. Okay, and then Lainey can be our translator. <gasps> yes. This is the perfect plan. The perfect plan. I love it. And like I said, when I started this story, this could be a tragic tale. A story told sadly as night falls in the dwindling town. But no, this town has looked itself in the mirror and said, you're a genius. And, the, and is embracing themselves. <laughs> <laughs> They're embracing it and they turn this unhappy ending into something we're celebrating. They share the story with the world. It's a complicated history, but they embrace it. They've rebuilt the castle and it is now a host to a witchcraft museum. It holds magical objects like cauldrons and brooms. There's a statue of Latia Casca, the last witch to be killed in Trasmos. She was killed in 1860 because people in the town blamed her for an epidemic. Apparently, she was accused of starting the epidemic with witchcraft in 1860 all because she was a more reserved, introverted soul. And as punishment, she was pushed. 1860 just feels so recent. I know. Well, this whole time you've been talking, I'm picturing like the 1500s. Well, the it began in like 1200 and then the history kind of followed it. Yeah. Okay. So she was pushed down a well to her death as punishment. And that was the, and she was the last witch to die or last woman to die being accused of a witch in Trasmods. Every summer in June, Trasmods hosts a Feria de Brujia y Magica, a fair of witchcraft and magic, which features an entire day of magical events, reenactments of the town's history, people dress up, people can enjoy a medieval camp and a market stocked with lotions and potions, all made from native plants with healing and hallucinogenic properties. There are parades, Ooh. live music, falconry demonstrations, hypnosis, magic shows, fireworks, and sword fighting, which <gasps> sounds so fantastic. Sounds like a dream. Oh, wait, does everyone sword fight together or is it a show that you watch? I think Either way, can, I'm down. I think you can participate. Uh, I mean, I took stage combat. I'm yeah, ready. you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. And... To top it all off, the festival culminates in the town naming the Witch of the Year. One lucky resident is picked to parade down the street, give a speech, and carry the title of Witch of the Year for the entirety of the year until it's passed on the next year. This and is the best. I cannot believe I this know. is a real place. I feel like I you're know. telling me the story, like the plot of what would be <laughs> my favorite novel ever. Oh my God. You gotta go. So really- I love this. Ruiz Diaz, who's a resident of Trasmos and most recently elected Witch of the Year in 2008, said that you have to have a knowledge of herbal medicine in order to be the Witch of the Year. But most importantly, you have to be involved in the history and promotion of all things connected with Trasmos. To be a witch today is a badge of honor. 
And you bet that the residents of the town now embrace their witchy history and honor the pagan holidays. They celebrate All Saints Day and Winter Solstice and are very welcoming and open to the rituals to protect themselves from negative spirits. And it's a common thing for tourists to go and participate in these solstice rituals. And Ruiz said that the town isn't the kind of place filled with people who can get rid of the evil eye. Instead, they celebrate their history as a way to recover the village's link to witches while also reclaiming the persecution that these women were subject to, which I think is beautiful. Yeah, that is really nice. And as with, you know, any kind of complicated history, there are a few people in town who don't like it. But they also know that their town needs the festival or they risk disappearing. Even today, Ruiz says no one wants to consider asking the Pope to remove the curse or excommunication because it could ruin their town. Today, it's a popular des- tourist destination and they've embraced the history. But also because the poet Gustavo Aldafo Bicure recovered from a severe tuberculosis uh, about in and around Trasmos, and he used to walk up to the castle. And so he would write in, in his poetry about Trasmos and romanticized it, but also possibly fictionalized it a bit. But people will come to do like the same walk that he walked. Mm. And the best time to visit Trasmos is precisely at the end of October or beginning of November during the festival of the Light of the Souls, which honors the dead and proceeds to the collection of pumpkins with the respective decoration workshops. The day usually culminates in the procession of the souls, which draws a path from the village church to the cemetery. That is so cool. That is so cool. We we should put this in the, sorry, on Discord, there's another channel that we have. It's a private channel that's called like the TGOG road trip, because we've always talked about like going and and doing the road, a road trip. And so Mm -hmm. in preparation for what will one day be our road trip, (laughs) um, we made the Discord channel and I asked Earlier today, I was like, are there any, aside from like Salem, Massachusetts, what would also yeah. be a really like great place to visit for like some sort of spooky festival? Ooh. And this would be, this, this would is be like perfect. a perfect thing to add on the list. Yeah. Yes. This and then Halloween Town in Oregon. Mm-hmm. And there's another town that does like a big, hmm, there's so many. There's so many. Oh, wait, the right. place in, it's a, also a witch place, a place in Europe where if you walk around the building, 13... 13 oh, times on Halloween. And you, like, knock on the door or something. Yeah. You yeah. talked about that and like such a long like, time ago. A great, oh my God. I think it was like the first year we were doing this. <laughs> the fact yeah, that you even so remember many. that. There's so yeah, many. there's so many. We'll keep talking about yeah. it. If you have suggestions, let us know. Comment below. Can we do that now? Comment below. <laughs> <laughs> where is the button? I literally have no idea where any of this I stuff would be. I think we put a button. No? Oh, it would be I don't somewhere... Know. Somewhere on this. Here, we'll just go like this. And this. then there will be at least one of them will work. At some Comment point below. in one of these moments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what is YouTube? Work. Yeah. You know what? Here's the thing. We're excited to be on YouTube. We don't know how to YouTube. So Wait, it is what it is. I just got a great idea. What if like in the beginning of every episode, we high five and we will like add the sound in later? Oh. Ready? Oh my god, I love that. Ready? Wait. <laughs> oh fuck. We're so awkward. Are you ready? Okay. Ready? <laughs> Wait, why are you? I feel like I have to go back further. I'm so much okay, closer ready? to the screen. Okay. Three, two, one. What? Oh. <laughs> we we're even counting backwards. Okay. Well, you, you count. I say nothing. I just clap. Okay. Three, two, one. Wait, why'd you just go so slow, Sabrina? Like, go go fast. fast. Okay, we'll go fast. You're okay. going like this. Like we were just touching hands. Okay, okay. ready? Three, like, two. Like, okay, three, two. Wait. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, ready? Three, three two, one. two, one. Wait, I was going <laughs> to <out. laughs> I give up. I give up. <laughs> I got impatient. I had to do the three, two, one myself. <laughs> Sorry. If, if your eight page um, ring PowerPoint didn't tell anything to anyone else. Control, it's about baby. Control. control. It's all about control. <laughs> <laughs> Moving forward, though, you'll do it in the beginning. The three, two, one. one. And just. Oh, wait. Where'd my hand go? Why did, why did I do that? Why I do know. I have no spatial awareness? What's happening? Wait, we haven't okay. done the triangle yet either. Oh, 
there's a lot happening that is happening on video that I probably won't translate to audio, but, but sorry, not sorry, sorry. not sorry. Uh, I'm going to get comfy. <clears throat> okay. <sighs> okay. <laughs> tell me a story, Corinne. I will tell you a story. And it, I mean, while Tom, our Patreon donor picked this out, I will say, so we post on Patreon and say, basically like two weeks ahead of time, what the topic will be. And mm-hmm. sometimes people give us suggestions or then they'll like send us our, their related email or encounter. Um, but Sierra had brought up in Patreon when we posted about this, she said, have you heard of Linda Green? You should talk about Linda Green. I don't know Linda Green. And that, that is what led me to Linda Green and her cult, the Samaritan Foundation. Oh. It is fascinating okay okay hold on let me fix my little necklace because it was bothering me okay (laughs) so my resources for this research primarily came from articles written by jack helbig david ferris strange but true and strange 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 i like that strange 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 i know i can't even say it three times fast strange 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 obviously right up our alley yeah So now this is not to say, and I think we like already somewhat prefaced this episode by saying like the occult is not bad. When we hear people speaking about the occult, oftentimes it's, it's to induce fear, to incite fear. And there are many times too, where like Sabrina and I, you and I together will be talking about certain haunted places. And part of the reason why it's haunted is like, because there were occult practices there and all right. this stuff. And it's not to say that any of this stuff was bad. It's just meant to say that there was this connection there, that these right. locations and these people are opening up and there's potential yeah. for something darker to take advantage. It's not li- unlike any religion or really yeah. any belief where you throw your energy towards something. I was just going to say, like, I feel like with anything in the world, people can take it to a negative extreme, even if the intentions were positive. And it's not to say that every, every person who practices X, Y, Z religion is a bad person. It's just that there are people who can go either way. It's like when we talk about aliens and cryptids, it's like, well, and ghosts, like literally anything where it's like, well, sometimes there's good, sometimes there's bad. Yes. And that's just the way of the world. It's a cosmic that's just the natural balance. State. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So for the Samaritan Foundation, it was a quasi-religious group with which advocated a blend of holistic medicine and new age practices. They studied alien abductions and demonic <gasps> possessions. So it's like, Stop. oh my God. Like, we would have signed up. I would for like, sure would have. Ah! Oh my God. It, yeah. It sounds so great. Yeah. And I think a lot of other people thought it sounded freaking yeah. fascinating too. So, yeah, you and I would probably join Sabrina. Yeah, I would. Um, But the leader of this, the founder of this foundation, Linda, Linda Green, she seemed to be a bit more troubled with her beliefs. And like many other cult leaders, she spiraled. Hmm. And Linda believed that she was Christ because she willingly gave her soul so that all of her followers could live. She also relied on a pendulum to answer a lot of her and her followers' questions, which Mm -hmm. isn't bad and and also no. used it to like you know remove evil you know find yeah energy like people use it all the time in like reiki and chakra energy clearing and whatnot yeah. however for linda it was a little bit different because she believed the barcodes on products were evil so like this the scanned barcode and so oh. her and all of her followers would swing pendulums around the barcodes for anything that they bring bring home from the grocery store or from wherever. So like there was a lot of these like odd little things and people got really extreme and super into it and started using the pendulum to like, you know, it was taking over people's lives. I was going to say that seems very time consuming to do that to everything you bring home. Yes. Also, what time period is this? What, where, where are we time wise? We are in the 1990s. Well, I guess 1980s bleeding into the 1990s. Okay. Okay. Oh, so not too long ago. Not too long ago. I mean, she started, so like the foundation took a little while for, for her to actually like full on start it, but like she had yeah. already been writing and, and doing her teachings and everything. And she was, I believe she was, oh, I'm going to butcher this cause I de- totally didn't write it down, but I think she was like, she was like a poet and an author. And I think she was like a nurse. Like she had all of these ordinary things in her the life. The more you talk that, about her, the more I think we might be becoming Linda Green. I freaking hope not, Sabrina. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
I mean, this is all to say, I will preface this by saying I, Linda, I think very much needed help oh, and her family okay. did end up putting her into treatment for mental disorders. Okay. And so I think there was a lot of things that went untreated, Yeah, but yeah. that's not to say that's still not an excuse for what happened, nor is it an excuse for the hundreds of people that still followed her. Okay. So there was a lot of people, she just had a lot of persuasion and she really believed the things that she believed. Okay. okay so okay. telephones were also to be avoided as vampires could gain access to them and steal your soul. So if you were a part of this foundation, if you were a follower of the Samaritan foundation, you needed to communicate either in person, writing a letter or using a fax machine because your soul wow. needed to be protected from vampires. She also spoke about spiritual waste and how you could propel this bad waste into celebrities because celebrities are zombies with no souls oh. who feel nothing from the procedure. So oh you could just gosh. toss your spiritual and energetic waste onto them. For example, <laughs> Rosa Roseanne Arquette was a Ray Octave zombie. Madonna was a Nephilim zombie and Bill Clinton was a animal mutant zombie. And there were just like all of these specifications for what types Whoa. of zombies all of these celebrities were. So okay. people were like meditating and like pushing their energy. Have you watched celebrities. What We Do in the Shadows, the TV show? No. Okay. So there's no. a movie. Um, and then I think it's Taika Waititi, I think, or he's acting in it. I don't know. Anyway, but then there's a show and there's um, a energy vampire that sucks energy away from people. So just being around him, like he gets his, instead of blood sucking he gets his energy from like sucking energy away from people. So everyone's like really depressed oh, around him. Kind of like a dementor. Or like, uh, oh my gosh, in Halloween Town, Cal Calabar's Revenge. Remember? He just like sucks the soul. Everyone's oh, like just, yeah. just zombie walking yeah, around. Yeah, they're zombie walking. A yeah, shell of like themselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe Linda was kind of onto something here. I don't know. Who am I to yeah. say? Uh, but these were just basically a few examples where people's beliefs in this group and right. Linda's beliefs became a little too fantastical and their grip with reality started to sever. And unfortunately yeah. for Linda Green and her followers, the followers of the Samaritan Foundation, this led to a murder within the group. Oh, no. So this is kind of like almost like a true crime crossover that I'm going to tell you about. <laughs> Any excuse to slip in true crime. Right. So Alan Ross, he was the unsuspecting victim. And in an article written by David Ferris, David stated... Alan Ross was a free spirit. He wore thrift store clothes and Converse tennis shoes to complement his tall, gangly frame. His glasses contributed to his meek yet intellectual appearance. A filmmaker, Ross helped create a foundation that helps struggling artists find resources to complete their products. Oh. Or, sorry, their projects. Yeah, which is really sweet. Like, he's That's obviously so involved yeah. in the community and everything. Yeah. With enthusiasm border bordering on eccentric... Ross dove into the paranormal. In 1986, he began to dabble in the occult, or as he called it, the mysteries, with his live-in girlfriend, Flanagan McKenzie. By early 1992, their relationship was waning, but they remained friends, united by an interest in the supernatural. Then, McKenzie heard about a lady from Guthrie, Oklahoma, which was this mm. lady, Linda, who was conducting seminars at a hotel near the O'Hare airport that involved the use of pendulums for spiritual awareness. Alan Ross had everything, the love and support of his family and friends, high status in his professional community. And then one day he abandoned his near perfect life, left Chicago and moved to Oklahoma. And so this is what happened to Alan. Like he, he was dating this girl. They were super into sort of, it, it's like yeah. you and I, Sabrina, like, if, if I started talking to you about this thing, all of these like readings that I read and all of these teachings and like started getting you into it and you're like, yeah. oh, I'm super into that too. And that's what happened to him. He followed his intrigue. Like he was a filmmaker. Yeah. He was a storyteller. He was a fan of the supernatural. So naturally he was, once he was introduced to Linda Green's teachings, he was like, I want to learn right. more. Right. And it led and to him And as we know with cult, cult. behavior, it's it's so subtly happening that you don't realize it. Like they're just slowly right. isolating you from your family and your friends and making you think this is the only thing that's important in your life. And then, yeah. Yeah. 
I know I didn't write about this, but I'll just say it really quick. There was most of what we know about the teachings of the Samaritan Foundation were only public because there was this woman who lived in Somerville, Massachusetts, like literally 10 minutes away from where I am right yeah. now, who started receiving these pamphlets and these teachings from Linda and asked her husband if she could take her their two kids to Oklahoma for this like 10-day retreat that was happening. It was going to be like the opportunity of a lifetime, like so freaking right. cool. So he was like, okay. And then they get there. And this is this is why you made me think of it was because you were like, it, it's like a slow introduction. And I think ordinarily it is, but as soon as you're there, you get sucked in really yeah. fast because it was a 10 yeah. day retreat. And he immediately was like, something's wrong because his family oh, stopped wow. talking to him. If they <gasps> did make contact, it was like so brief. Then she didn't return with the kids. He basically had to like get involved. There was the court, the trial, the kids were oh like summoned back. And all a lot of this came out in terms of like the beliefs with the vampires and everything. So that's why Whoa. we know so much of what we know. Like without that case, we probably wouldn't have known half of what oh, this wow. group believed Jeez. in or what Linda was teaching people. Yeah. But yeah, so Al Alan, he was he was into it and he had a close group of friends in Chicago, but he was also pretty introverted. Um and then so then when he moved in with this cult, he still kept in touch with his friends in Chicago, but never really said much about what was going on and, and what he was doing with the group. He was notorious for sending these postcards that had like four words on it. Like basically mm -hmm. what I was kind of laughing about with you in the beginning when you were like, why though? Like what what's <laughs> yeah. up? Like, like why just this? a few words. Yeah. Yes. So he was very, very brief. Um, but one thing that did end up happening to him when he lived there was that he ended up marrying Linda Green and he traveled with the oh, group for Linda's instructions. That is not where I thought this was going. Yeah. So here's a weird detail for you. So okay. at one of Linda's retreats before they were married, Alan was a part of this retreat where all of the cup, all of these people of opposite sex. I think maybe opposite sex. I don't really know, mm -hmm. but two people at the retreat were paired up together and they were married. So Alan had ended up marrying this woman that he'd only known for three days. That was at the retreat. He goes back to Chicago, tells his friends and family, and they're all like, what the fuck? But regardless, he's super into it. Like with cults, you can't, you can't pull someone back to reality right. very easily. So yeah. That's what happened to him. And then he eventually, after that, moves full time back to Oklahoma. And Linda then tells her followers that she's sick. And in order to be healed, this woman, this wife of Alan and Alan, need to have sex with each other on top of her, on top of Linda. I'm so they do. Sorry. <laughs> well I'm just, just <laughs> say you want to have sex with Alan. Like it's okay. I also just, I'm trying to picture it. A sex on top of her. The, yeah. I know. That's why so I'm she trying just to picture lays too. Like flat. Flew. Yeah. And just like has them roll. On top. I don't know. I don't know. I don't and know also, who that's I more uncomfortable like, for. Did this happen in front of everyone else? Was this like a ritual? Like, was this like a sex show? Was it on stage or was this like in private? I need more information. I have so many but questions. We won't get it. I have so many logistical questions. I know. Uh, yeah. Anytime there's more than two, I have a lot of questions. Also, uh, so. Okay. I'll move on. My brain is still no, there. But I will, no, I just. I just. How did people react to that question? How do you ask someone to have sex on top of you? <laughs> it just. I don't I'm just know. imagining myself asking someone to have sex on top of me, but not have sex with me. And just, I can't imagine that the response would be positive. Well, it just reminds me of all of those cult documentaries. Like what, what was the wild, wild country? Or yeah. The, yeah. Ma Anand Sheila and that, yeah. that whole group. Um, Nexium just, too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. people, people just look around and no one else thinks it's odd. So then they're like, oh, I guess this is it. And just, yeah. I think the first time like you let yourself do it. Heard following. Just like, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So she asks them to have sex on top of her and they do. <laughs> and then Linda declares that she has been healed. So the sex worked. And then that she's actually going to take Alan as her husband. So what did now, Alan's Alan, girlfriend or wife think or do? Do we know? We don't have these. We don't have okay. these details. We no, don't have like, answers. There's so much missing. There's not. Right. Oh, there's so much missing. Right. 
I mean, maybe someone does, maybe there's a documentary that like goes through all of this, but I think most of the documentaries out there are more specific to like Alan's disappearance. And there's oh, not gotcha. that much that we can find out about the Samaritan foundation and okay. especially like what was happening towards the end of it before it dissolved. So anyway, so she takes Alan as her husband and now Alan, he's full fledged Samaritan foundation guy. He's the husband to the leader, but he was still very active in the film community. Like you would think at that point that like all other contact would be shut off. And to a point it sort of right. was like he was giving people like fake phone numbers and addresses and stuff like that. But he still was working on documentaries, shooting film, like being an active participant in that community. And he was down on the Mississippi river working as a cameraman for another company. Um, it's, German documentary maker mm-hmm. when Alan suddenly just stops answering calls. Alan's oh. dad was the last person to speak with him. And then there was silence. <gasps> and then a month later, someone at the film production office had a call from Alan to wire the final paycheck. And then there was nothing again, no calls, no letters, oh my gosh. no way to contact him. Absolutely nothing. And remember they don't have, they like don't have phones basically right they don't use phones vampires will steal your soul if you yeah 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 so i mean alan was quiet he was but he was a well-liked guy he had a lot of friends his family said he never missed a holiday never like missed calling them or right doing like making some sort of contact but for him to just drop off the face of the earth was super alarming for everyone yeah and so his family they were like okay Maybe he'll get back to us. So they waited. They didn't hear anything. And then they became increasingly concerned. They hired a private detective who zeroed in on Alan's wife, Linda Green, and started to kind of gather whatever information he could on her. And then Alan's family also consulted two psychics who told them both, both the psychics told them that Alan was alive. One said that he was suffering from um, like a psychotic break. Another person said that he'd hit and injured his head. I think they both said oh. that, uh, or at least one of them said that he was alive in Texas. Another one said that he would come back and return and like make contact by Christmas or by the end of the year. Uh-huh. But, but he doesn't, there's no word from him. And oh, so no. rumors spread, articles are written, police are scoping out the house in Guthrie, Oklahoma, which was listed as the Samaritan foundation's last address. Like people are asking questions. He's friends with all of these filmmakers and documentary makers so like some of his friends are getting together and like starting interviewing like using their tools and resources and hobbies to try to freaking right. find what find alan it was not it was a manhunt to find alan it wasn't a manhunt to find out what happened to alan because they all thought he was alive right so now at this point the samaritan foundation there's very little membership happening because the trial had already happened with that woman from Somerville, Massachusetts. So there's there's information that's out there that makes it look bad to be a part of this group. Right. And so people so started to really distance. Exactly. They start distancing themselves. And even before Alan's disappearance, the group was also involved in and like suspected of a possible terrorist bombing and alan was pulled in and questioned by the police in this case so people were just like oh my things are like going off the rails like i should have done more research but this was already like eight pages long so i was like i'm just gonna leave (laughs) leave it at that it just spit everywhere but (laughs) does a subtle throw in a terrorist bombing (laughs) just T- potential terrorist bombing yeah i think it was in oklahoma or maybe it was chicago so there but they are really going off the rails a bit. Yes, things are happening. This is very yeah. like Waco, Texas. It's and it's all culminating. There. Yeah. Exactly. So when Alan disappeared, the Samaritan Foundation, they had just four members. They had Linda Green, who was the leader. They had Alan Ross, who was who's who we're talking about and was her yeah. husband. They had Linda's friend Julia. And then Linda's fourth husband, Dennis Green, who she divorced from just before Alan and her married. So Alan is her fifth husband. Okay. So it all comes out that Dennis, the fourth husband, called Cheyenne police in Wyoming. Not So we're, we're not even in Oklahoma anymore. He calls the Cheyenne police and tells them that Linda killed Alan in Cheyenne. So not in their house where they had lived in, in Oklahoma, but that she killed Alan and told them where to find Alan's body. 
and that <gasps> Julia helped bury him. And while this is happening, Linda is sending faxes to Guthrie's police department, their like local Oklahoma police department, stating that Dennis killed Alan and where to find oh the body. Gosh. And remember, like L- Linda thinks that vampires will take her soul through the phone. So she's these are all faxes. Yeah. She's not calling anyone. And she's telling them that she's being set up. She's nothing to do with it. It's all Dennis and that his body is not in the house in Guthrie, but instead in a crawl space in another house in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So basically they told on themselves. Right. And this was like a year after he disappeared. So it makes there me must have been a lot what, happening between right, the, like the, yeah, something had to have happened for them to just like at the same time turn on each other, turn on exactly. each other. Yeah, right. So we don't know exactly what happened, uh-huh. but the police go to this house. They dig. They find nothing. The case goes cold. Alan's considered missing, not murdered. But then five years later, the police revisit the scene. Like it's about to be officially like cold case, like locked away, not touched again. They go and they revisit the scene and they're examining it. And then they notice that there's like a little shoe, like a Converse shoe poking out. And then they start digging and they find Alan's body exactly where How did they, they said miss it would be. his body the first time? That is the question that everyone keeps asking. Everyone is so frustrated. There's all of these journalists that have been following the case since Alan first went missing and were like kind of clued into it. And it's like the biggest thing where they're like, what the hell happened? Like, what is their excuse? How did they not? Especially if they were told exactly exactly where where, where they said it was. Yeah. Yes. For them to not do just a little more. Anyway. Who knows? Five years later, they they found his body. So the autopsy discovered or or found that Alan had been shot twice, once in the head, and that he was castrated. Oh, my gosh. Linda was asked again who killed Alan, and she said, the specialist. Shit. Once they go too far into mind control, they terminated him. That's all I'm allowed to say. It's top secret. It's like, clearly, there's... Yeah. She's, She's giving different versions of events. The entire time. Like she's not right. doing well at this point. Yeah. Linda never went to jail because just one year later at 50 years old, due to liver failure from alcoholism, uh, she passed away. Oh no. Linda suffered from hearing voices in her head and left untreated for a long time, despite some of her family's interventions at certain points. Uh, she tried to drink a lot to try to stop hearing those voices, oh. which is really, really sad. So sad. So her friend Julia, who helped bury Alan, got two years in prison for being an accessory after the fact to murder. And then Dennis, though there was some evidence suggesting that he was involved, was never tried for anything because there just wasn't enough reliable evidence, especially wow. because the two witnesses, which were like Julia and Linda, definitely were not reliable. Right, right. So obviously this case is horrible. And what sounded like an amazing foundation, an amazing occult organization in the mm-hmm. beginning spiraled into something that was like absolutely atrocious. Yeah. People were losing touch and Alan lost his life because of it. And a lot of other families similar to any cult were broken up because that's what it was becoming. It was yeah. no longer a celebration for everyone and a chance to explore certain things of the world together. It very much became a cult where like, again, like you were saying, Sabrina, you're, you're taken from your family and you're, yeah. Yeah. Like your ties are severed and you're encouraged to basically make it your whole life. And you're taught not to trust anything or anyone else outside of the organization. So you have, it's kind of like the unreliable narrator uh, in your life. It's like someone's telling Mm -hmm. you that everything else in your life is like a lie. And so you right. don't know what to believe and you can only believe that one person. Exactly. And I think Linda was very persuasive and That's sad. a lot of people did believe that. So, wow. yeah, the case is horrible. A cult leader suffered greatly in her life yeah. and then ended up murdering her husband. Uh, there's magic, there's mediums, there's so much threaded through this case and this occult organization. But one thing that's very fascinating to me that I want to bring up outside of this actual organization and Alan's 
murder was that the house where they were originally investigating Alan's disappearance in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. that house that they had set up shop that the Samaritan Foundation lived in and all these people came and like, it was basically like a, just like a drop down house for anyone to come live in was a house that had a very brutal past and is super haunted. What? So I'm going to tell you just a blurb about this house. Oh my gosh. So this structure in Oklahoma, it was built in 1892, 15 years before Oklahoma became a state, which I was like, 1892? Wait, Oklahoma 1892? State? Doesn't that seem crazy? I should have fact checked it that. Does, it does, but then it but, also, relative to our American history, like I guess that kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because it was only 100 years after. After what? <laughs> The Declaration of Independence. Oh, 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 yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. History is not After my we, like, forte. Started, I do love Hamilton? history. I learned all I did. history from Hamilton, the musical. I did. I do love history, but I feel like I retain it for a small amount of time. And then and then I yeah. take up space with TikTok right. now because you've Well, and it's, it's hard because me. half of the stuff we learned when we were like, in sixth grade. I know. And I was like, I don't remember those details. I had a lot of other things to worry about at that age. The way that we were taught was just like memorize quickly so you can get a good grade rather than like embrace and really like retain the information. Exactly. Yes. Yes. I agree. Okay. So before Oklahoma was a state, the structure was built for a, to be a prison. So it was this prison. The walls were 18 oh. inches thick with dark limestone and brick walls. It was the first federal prison in the Midwest and supposedly it was inescapable. Referred to <laughs> by inmates as the Black Jail, this place held 90 prisoners. It had a basement for solitary confinement and it had no insulation for winter, Whoa. no heat relief in the summer. Inmates suffered from dehydration, the flu, respiratory infections, and at least one person died. Whoa. At one point, it housed famous Wild West criminals Dalton Gang and Bill Doolin, and Bill even managed to escape this unescapable. I think there was like fourteen people that escaped, so right. not really inescapable. I feel like every but, every like big prison's like we are unescapable, right? Well, don't they hire? I swear, I watched a video years ago of this guy whose job is literally to be put in prison, and none of the guards or inmates. There's a movie like about that. It was. Did I just watch the movie and think it was? You real? may have watched or, or, or the like trailer. I'm remembering it yeah. as being real. Where yeah, like I mean, it's his entire maybe it's job based on a real thing. Yeah. To, yeah, we're like trying to break out, to test out the security of the prison. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe it was just a movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I believe that that's a that's job. A true job. I believe it. that would be cool. I yeah, that would be cool. It's like I mean, an escape room. Yeah. Why wouldn't it? Especially after that movie came out, if it wasn't a job, make it a job. That's a good idea. Fine, Corinne. Whoa, I'm Fine, stuttering. Corinne. A new, a new uh, avenue for you and I to If the to CIA explore. won't take us, then we need to <laughs> escape prison. I would not do well in prison. I would not that. either. No. No. Okay. So this jail, once it is eventually closed, it's abandoned. And then it reopens sometime later as the Nazarene Church before... They left, abandoned this place again, and then eventually is purchased by Linda Green and the Samaritan Foundation. So the Samaritans who uh, killed Alan Ross, I guess, uh, they lived in this building. And this building had already seen a ton of struggling and desperate people, illnesses and disease and death, which is why I feel like it's no surprise that things started to spiral for them all there. Is there, are uh, there photos of this place? Because Um, I'm so curious what it looked like between the transitions, like a prison to a church to a home. Those are all very different. Like, I'm curious what it looked like when they lived there. Yeah. Um, here, let me show you a picture. Okay. This is, so it's in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Guthrie, I'm not really sure how to say it, but I guess it kind of makes sense. Like based on how the structure, wait, let me turn up. I'm not making the same mistake I did last time where you were like, your brightness, I can't see. So here. Oh. Oh, okay. I could see. So it's okay. big enough. Yeah. It's pretty big. Like, I feel like it could even be like a school. Like it could it be. It does. Yeah. It's one of those things where it could basically be anything. 
Yeah. It's set up so that it, yeah, it's just like a giant rectangular brick building. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it only housed 90 people too when it was a prison. So right. I guess it makes sense. I guess I'm picturing, uh, cause you said at the end of the Samaritan group, it was like four people really. So I'm imagining mm-hmm. four people living in there. I'm like, that's massive. Yeah. But at some point it was yeah, much bigger. I don't know if yeah. they, right. I assume they still lived there because I know the phone calls. I mean, Linda was contacting that local police department yeah. while Dennis was contacting the police department of the place they actually like buried, killed and buried Alan. Yeah, and Alan. So it, it's all spaced out and there's not a ton of answers because again, like Linda passed away and she wasn't able to give an accurate account. And then there right. was a lot of finger pointing from the other two involved too. Right. So. And probably a lot of like self-protection finger pointing. So it's like the narrative exactly. isn't actually true. Yeah. Right. Okay, so this two-story building, it rattles with the sound of metal doors slamming shut, which, by the way, there's only one metal door left in the whole building on the property today. And then the basement, the hallways, and the first floor are accustomed to phantom disembodied voices drifting through, and the illnesses that once overtook the prison left a lasting stain, as you can hear coughing inside of old cells. Children are also heard playing outside of it, which maybe could have been... I don't know, like a residual haunting of the From Samaritan the tur- Foundation when they were there because oh, yeah. there were like, I think like 12 kids, kids at one point. Um, or the what church. What is it now? When, what is it now? I think it's just abandoned. I'm not oh. sure. That's a great question. I don't know. We can find out. Yes. Yeah. You're asking me a lot of questions. I don't know the answer to. <laughs> You're like, oh my That's gosh, okay. a terrorist bombing. What happened? I'm like, I don't should have looked that up. <laughs> I don't know. We'll cut, so much going on. we'll cut it out. We'll cut out all my questions. No, no, no. We got to keep them. Keep okay. me accountable. I'll do more research <laughs> next time. Okay. So while there are clearly many spirits in this space, there are two better known people, two better known spirits who haunt the property. Ooh. The first is a woman wearing a long patterned dress, a large hat and white gloves. And she's usually heard singing near the main entrance, but she's also oh. seen around dusk crossing the street coming back towards the building, towards the entrance. And witnesses believe that she was once a member of the Nazarene church yeah, and that she was there prior to, you know, the Samaritan foundation moving right. in. The second spirit and the most notorious is a man named James Phillips. He was a prisoner when it was a, a prison at the black, the black jail. And now James, uh, well, he's still there, obviously. He's haunting it. But he wasn't in prison just for like a petty crime. I feel like I pictured a lot of people in the Wild West like being in, in jail for stupid ass shit. Yeah. Like there today. <laughs> but but at the same time, I want to also preface this as, as saying that it was the the Wild West. And uh-huh. there's still people who were falsely convicted and in jail today. So this is kind of reminding me a little bit of um, oh my gosh, what's the old the old Charleston jail, La, 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 Lavinia Fisher, Lavinia Fisher. Yeah. It's, it's maybe a, I, I don't really yeah, know what you know, he, yeah, he did it or not. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't want to speak too rudely about him just in case. His crimes was, were not actually what he, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So he was a prisoner, uh, because he was convicted of murdering a local man. James was arrested. He was thrown into the, into jail and he, was the first white man sentenced to be hanged at the jail in the summer of 1907. Wow. And he never really made it to his hanging, to the gallows, to his conviction, because instead he watched from his tiny cell window of solitary confinement as guards constructed the gallows to carry out his sentence later that day. And he collapsed and he died. And coroners (gasps) concluded that it was due to heart failure that he died of fright watching. Oh my gosh. I know it like made me really oh, sad to it does make me sad. learn that. Yeah. And unfortunately for James, he never got to leave. Almost immediately following his death, guards, other prisoners, people visiting the jail all claimed to hear his footsteps moving through his cell. And his spirit still remains on the property. He's seen peering out of the jail cell windows and wandering the halls leading up to the jail. And if you don't see him, you may hear him. Oh, because oh no. he sobs. Oh no! In his cell. Oh, no. That breaks my heart. <laughs> I know. I I have chills, like not because of ghostly uh, things, but because I yeah. It just 
I hope it's that so that's sad. just a residual haunting and that his spirit is, I do like that his spirit can wander around. Like he's not stuck and refined to just that to space that he was held in. At least it but didn't that, seem like that. But. Yeah. That he can wander around. And I hope that the crying is just residual and not something that his soul has to keep enduring. Right. I know. I uh, don't want anyone to, no matter what people did with the exception of a couple of people in history, yeah. I want their, them to like find Find some find peace, peace, you know? I know. Yeah. I know. Or at least get to, like, try again in your next life. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, obviously, to wrap this up, the Samaritan Foundation was surrounded by spirituality, hauntings, and darkness. They lived together in a haunted home. They let themselves get lost in these wondrous and often terrifying ideas. And yeah. they watched as people abandoned their families to be closer to Linda's teachings. They f- married fellow Samaritans who knew them for only three days and they bared witness to Linda's murderous hands. This case is so big. There's so many more details about the Samaritan foundation and the people who followed it, but not nearly enough time to make it make sense and to truly understand what happened to Alan Ross. Right. But that is the Samaritan foundation, the murder of Alan Ross and the cult house, the black jail. Wow, Trifecta. so much in one, Corinne. We got I cults, know. we got true crime, we got ghosts, we got witches, it, we got vampires, aliens, everything. Yeah, liter- yeah, everything. Wow. Zombies. Zombies. Zombies, celebrities. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot going on. There was. There was, and there was so much more, like there's so much more for me to read too, and you can go through like, you know, all of the court yeah, yeah. documents and everything, but I, I yeah. Just Cults are so this complex. Could easily, if because, there, anyone else has like yeah. a, I was just gonna say if anyone else has a podcast where they do like really deep dive, like this could be like a five part episode. Oh yeah, I will just listen this to one it. topic. Let us know if yeah. you guys do that because we will listen. It's so interesting. I feel like every every organization like this, a cult, whatever it may be, there's so much one unknown, and two, there's so much to be discussed because you know, I feel like a lot of them start from a good place and then it gets complicated and, you know, people Mm -hmm. get lost in the idea of power and control and then they just spin it so out of, um, control and then it turns into this. Right. It's, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating subset of psychology. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's just so, there's so many layers and there's like a lot of patterns too that you can discover. But then again, it's, it's one of those things where I'm like in the right conditions, like I might accidentally find myself in a cult too. You never know. Yeah. Well, until you live it, you don't, you don't know. Right. And I always joke that this is a cult. It's not, but that's also what cult leaders would say. It is not. This so, isn't a cult. This, this is, is, but this is a not. Trying, or this is a Bermuda Triangle. This is a Bermuda Triangle. We just get lost in, we get lost in the fun of ghost stories. Yes. And you, you, you can escape it. We're not keeping you here. I mean, you can but try to escape stay. it. You can try to escape it, but our ghosts will follow you. <laughs> We're going to make you. it really hard to though. <laughs> 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 but we won't take you away from your families. We promise. No. Oh my gosh. We won't isolate we'll bring you. Your families we'll with bring us. you everyone. together. Yeah. Bring everyone. We're like more the merrier. Sabrina always says world domination because that's the point. Like we all want everyone together. To yeah. Just it's vibe. positive domination. Right. Exactly. Yeah. We want everyone to look in the mirror and say, you're a genius. Go serve You're real. a genius. <laughs> you're a genius. Go, go serve real. real. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I, I have a listener story from our listener Melissa, and it is called My Parents Conjured My Guardian and Then Couldn't Put Him Back. Hello, ladies. My name is Melissa, and I started listening to you about a year ago, and I'm not quite yet caught up. You make me look forward to my long work commute. She got lost in the triangle. I have a few crazy stories, but my favorite is the one about how my parents and their witch coven called a spirit to protect me and then screwed up putting him back where they found him. I love everything horror and haunted, which I get from my mother. My parents are Wiccan and also practice witchcraft, so my childhood was filled with a lot of magic and magical creatures, which is the best. I, I'm envious of I this know. childhood. Same. But much to my parents' disappointment, disappointment, Just kidding. I'm their favorite only child. I grew up cranky and skeptical and pretty conservative in my beliefs. I believe fully that us silly humans only understand a tiny fraction of what's out there, 
but I'm still extremely judgy. Believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. That being said, I'm pretty sure I have a guardian spirit. So here's the story. I started dating my now husband when we were 15. He always talked about how haunted the woods around his house were, and we had many experiences in those woods, including four separate sightings of Bigfoot. But that's a separate story, which, no, Melissa, we need it. This story, come on. <laughs> this story is great too, but we do need Ugh. Melissa's other story. Okay. Yes. One night I was spending the night at his home and I was just drifting off to sleep when I felt my boyfriend get into bed and curl up against my back. He slid his hand up onto my shoulder and squeezed, which woke me up a bit. The grip then tightened and then the fingers felt longer somehow and I realized the nails were digging into my shoulder and they were sharp. At this point, I am fully awake and panicking. I had no idea what to do since this thing was between me and the door. I was planning my escape when suddenly there was a bright blue flash, like lightning, only it lasted longer and faded very, very slowly. The body behind me was immediately gone, and I felt this really calm and warm feeling. I ran out of the room, and my boyfriend had been downstairs the whole time. He wasn't entirely convinced that I wasn't dreaming, and honestly, neither was I. But a few days later, I told my mom about the experience. When I got to the part where I saw the flash, she stopped me. She looked surprised and asked, did the light look like lightning, except it was slower? I said, yes. And she said, huh, I guess we never did put him back. What? What? What, what did you do? She explained oh to me that God. when, <laughs> huh, guess we never did put him back. Huh. She explained to me that when I was younger, I had terrible night terrors. I actually remember these and believe they were actually sleep paralysis. She said I would just wake up screaming every night. My parents were worried that I was being tormented by something evil, so their coven conjured up a spirit to help protect me. The deal was it would help me for a year and then they were to release it. So they decided to conjure a water spirit, which they took from the lake, on, from the lake that we lived on. The night terrors did eventually stop, and one year later the coven got back together to put the spirit back. The only problem was that in their haste to help me, they didn't consider the fact that a year later the lake may be frozen since they didn't since they did the original conjuring during a fairly warm winter. There they were, a bunch of a bunch of witches in robes in the middle of the night prepared to do a ritual in the middle of a suburban working class town in the 80s and one of them had to <laughs> use his use his ritual axe to chop a hole in the ice. They are lucky they didn't have the police called on them or worse. Anyway, after all that, it turns out they either didn't put him back properly or he never wanted to leave me anyway. That was the only time I've ever seen him, but who knows? Maybe he is working behind the scenes or has found a new home in the property I live in now, which has two rivers flowing through it. I am also obsessed with water and will jump into any water I come across at any time. I wonder if you have a spirit attached to you for long enough. Maybe a little bit of them becomes a part of you. Thanks so much for all you do. You are amazing. Love and light, Melissa. I mean, it <laughs> sounds like she, it's a, it's like, oh, I'm flustered. A dream. Like, I want a group of witches to summon a water spirit to protect me. I know. I know. Me too. What's the, what's the downside of having it just protect you forever? I think they just kind of made a deal with the spirit saying like, hey, can you just help Melissa for a year? But to not and, take advantage of the yeah, spirit, like, yeah. maybe. Which, that makes me think that the spirit actually really likes Melissa and decided to take her on full time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you a manager. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it I reminds me like Big Mouth, like a, a hormone monster stress, you know? They, yeah. They've just, the spirit was like, you know what? I think Melissa needs me by her side. And maybe the spirit wanted... Maybe the spirit has freedom, you know, comes and goes and comes to Melissa's aid when Melissa needs him, her, whatever the spirit may be. Right. And, um, yeah, just, yeah, I guess I'm curious too, like in terms of the process of summoning that spirit, like how you exactly make the deal and can the spirit, like, do you have to, if the, if the spirit has the choice basically perhaps to potentially stay with her or with whoever the spirit's been summoned to help 
do you even have to put them back? Can they just put themselves back? Like, what is the, I don't know. Practice. Like what can they do versus what you have to do? I have so many questions. Melissa, can we interview your parents? And also Melissa, are you a part of this coven now? Do you believe fully now? Melissa, we need more. Growing up with with your parents being in a coven sounds amazing. And I love that Melissa like Sabrina, the, the teenage witch, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Or like the original Sabrina. Yeah. And I love that Melissa is the skeptical one. And she's just like, I grew up with this. I don't know. Like I believe in it, but I also don't believe in it. And I'm more skeptical than my parents. Yeah. Oh, I'm not skeptical at all. Oh, I believe. Us, I think we you should totally too, believe. But Melissa, we have, we have follow-up questions. We do. We do. We, do. we often do. Really envious. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I have an angelic encounter. Ooh. And this is from Beatrice, which already is such like a cool witchy vibe name, right? <laughs> Beatrice. I, I do think love so. It. Yeah. Hello, Corinne and Sabrina. Hope you're having a sunny, spooky day as always. Firstly, I just want to say that I binge listen to your podcast whenever I can. You guys are so easy to listen to and honestly seem like such good and beautiful people. Oh, nice. I hope you. you are. I'm writing to you from Switzerland where I've been living for the past three years and where I've had wow. a handful of weird experiences. Cool. Isn't that where your dad lives? Uh, he lives in Lithuania now, but he was in Switzerland. Oh, he, he was in he's Zurich. All over the place. I mean, he's all over the place. He was in Zurich for a little while. Now he's in Lithuania. Got it. Yeah. Okay. For context... I come from an agnostic family from lovely and sunny Portugal. <gasps> We're probably cousins. Uh, Honestly, half the time when I say that, we figure out that we are. <laughs> I might be going to Portugal this summer, so send me your Rex. Really? Yeah, after I'm, my sister's yeah. wedding. Oh, that would be fun. Okay, yeah, yeah. Beatrice, send, send recommendations Please. to Sabrina. When I was a kid, I loved everything supernatural and spooky, as one does, I guess, and I actually... And I was actually a ghost hunter for like three days before I gave up. (laughs) (laughs) Three days. they were really scared of me. (laughs) My three days as a paranormal ghost hunter. That's that's a book or movie. What happened in those three days? Yeah, I need to know more. More follow-up questions. You're right, Sabrina. That is a good, that reminds me of like the old, like 1880s. Like I'm just thinking of like the Trixie Belden books and and like that sort of vibe where it's like my, or like what was the... my babysitter is a vampire or whatever that oh, yeah. book is called. Yeah. Butchering, butchering the title. Um, but yeah, that'd be a good one. After moving to Switzerland, I started to be even more interested in the spooky stuff. M- my best friend, who has always been by my side for 24 years now, we're 26, by the way, is a believer and kind of a witch, actually. And this became a regular conversation topic between us. So I just dived in and started studying about the occult, gods, demons, angels, spirits, et cetera, et cetera. And I was actually a part of an occult school. Don't ask oh. though. I actually love those people. They were awesome. I want okay, to ask. How do I not ask? Yeah, I want I know. more. Like, Don't ask. Ha. <laughs> like, we're gonna um, ask. And if you were asking, yes, I sleep very well at night, and I have the sweetest dreams. <laughs> I have just always wondered what the hell were the Greek and the Egyptian and all those guys doing back then? You know, like the most intelligent people, and they were truly believed. And they truly believed in all of this stuff while creating science and mathematics. So maybe they were really onto something. I think so. In this email, I want to share the most real experience that I've ever had so far. Oh. It was a couple of years ago and I was journaling at night and some candles and some music were on. At the time, I was especially interested in the Bible and how good and evil is so distorted in it and how Lucifer's story doesn't really seem to be that well portrayed. And all of a sudden, the name Lucifer started being whispered in my head over and over again. And mind you, I was just writing about my day and my manager's funny shoes and they were really (laughs) funny and blah, blah, blah. And then whispers became screams. Like it was challenging Oh my gosh. And for some stupid reason, I said Lucifer out loud. Like it, it was nothing. Like it was just something that needed to be let out. And then I swear, I saw one of the three candles go crazy. It wasn't the wind. The windows were all closed. The candles were so far from them. At that point, I thought, this is weird, but okay. 
Oh my so gosh. I took a shower and I was cleaning the mirror with a towel when I saw this blondish, tall, handsome man behind me, smiling. Not ah. creepy, but actually charming and warm. And my first thought was, actually, damn, I really need to eat that Kit Kat, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was low blood sugar. But then he touched my shoulder and I felt shivers. And that was when I officially got scared. The name oh Lucifer gosh. was whispered one last time in my head. Then he disappeared and nothing else happened. Or at least I haven't noticed anything else after that. To this oh. day, I know I had this experience, but I'm still not sure if it's fair to say it was real, real. Meaning that sometimes I think that maybe this was just my imagination or that it was actually him. I don't know if everything is actually true. I believe everything we see dreams. I believe everything we see, dream, feel, et cetera, is real, but reality is too subjective more than we think. Yeah. I want to thank you for all of your effort and love everything that you do and put in the love you put into this podcast. Love, Beatrice. Of course, Lucifer comes off as hot. I know. What in the vampire diaries? <laughs> yes. I feel like, but that's like the tactic, right? Similar with kids mm -hmm. and, and like demonic entities appearing as kids. It's trying to get you to trust them. But I don't, I don't know if I trust a hottie. I, I like to I look at them. It is interesting too, because like people talk about, you know, like fallen angels and stuff. And I think yeah. we portray or so many artists portray angels as these like beautiful creatures. But I've been watching these videos and seeing these drawings that people are making of what angels are. Like based on the descriptions actually in the yeah. Bible of what angels would look like. And they're so scary. Well, <laughs> okay. Have you, Monsters, seen, Inc. have you seen Midnight Mass yet? No, 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 no. Okay. I, so I will. I will. Well, just this doesn't give away much, but there's what they believe is an angel and it's a terrifying creature, like really horrific and scary looking. And while it's intimidating, the people believe it's an angel because of the powers it has, but then... Is it an angel? That's the question. Got it. Got it. But yeah, yeah, it's interesting. But apparently Lucifer is the, yeah, like a hot guy. Yeah. Just, I love that. Beatrice is like, I really need to eat that Kit Kat. My, God, my, my blood, blood sugar, sugar must low. be low. <laughs> it is also yeah, interesting. I can't say I would think the same thing. When we, because I feel like we often talk, you know, about the dark things and there's this like temptation to know more about them, but then it's also... Uh, how much of that is just, you know, normal temptation, but also how much of that is they want you to want to know more about them because talking about them gives mm. them power. And, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, like the, the voices whispering Lucifer's name over and over into Beatrice's head is like this, we want you to engage with him. Right. Doesn't it feel very Beetlejuice-esque? Where it's very. like, you just have to say the name, like say it, say you it, You just say have it. to say it. Yeah. And then- I don't know what comes of it. Yeah. Given that I'm Beatrice that, hasn't experienced much more. Which is good. Maybe it's just like, hey, I exist and I want you to be aware of it. Right. Or maybe it was, yeah, I mean, I guess she was thinking about how his story felt like maybe unfairly told based yeah. on all of the research she had done in certain contexts. And maybe yeah. it was his way of being like, thank you. Know, you. A little hats off. Like, thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for... Thanks for believing in me. me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't either. But Beatrice, let us Ooh. know if you see Hottie McHot Hot Lucifer again. <laughs> Hottie, Hottie, Mr. L. Mm. Mm, Mr. L. Mm. <laughs> Come in my mirror. No, don't. Please don't. Please no, don't. don't. No. <laughs> Please. Please We're don't. We're not trying to summon anybody. We're just trying to Leia sit will protect me. in our homes. We're haunted enough. Yes, Leia will protect me. My big baby. Big old kitty. Look how big, big she baby. is. She, she is big. So big. I think now that we record video and people are going to wow. see on YouTube Leia in the videos, they're going to be shocked just how big she is. Eating my She's hair so then. cute. She is. She's a cutie. I love you. Because in the photos that you post of her, you can't tell because oftentimes you're not in them with her. And now you get her. to see that she's, she's, yeah, she's like a three bowling ball child. sizes. Ow! <laughs> oh, Leia. Excuse me. 
I was just talking about how cute you are. <laughs> I was the one calling you big, Leia. <laughs> wait, wait. Fruit fly is here. Fruit fly? I haven't seen him in a long time. I wonder if we caught that. He was truly right here. Oh, oh. Hi, fruit no, fly. I've got none. Sven is with us. Well, the candle is <sighs> almost out, which means it this is episode time must come to an end for our episode. Oh my gosh, it really is almost out. The tiny flickering flame. Wow. That's beautiful. I'll just hold it. Yeah. I'll just hold it here. Well, everyone, uh, we had a lovely afternoon, evening, morning with you, whatever time you are listening. We hope you have a lovely and spooky rest of your life. Um, and if you know anything about witches or if you were in a cult or if you know someone who was in a witchy cult or if you have any paranormal stories or cryptid stories or basically anything, please email them to us at twogirlsoneghostpodcast at gmail.com. And you can join our Patreon. You can rate and review us on iTunes. Mm -hmm. We have merch. We're going to be revamping our merch. Yes. Oh, it just went out. <gasps> Do you see? The candle, it's done. Goodbye. I still That's see it. a little ember. Bye. No. <laughs> um, yes, we are going to be revamping our Patreon. Yeah. Or Sorry, our, our merch very shortly. So if there's yep. any merch that you have been itching to grab, any designs... We would encourage you to grab do them so now, now before they're gone. Before you get um, sad. Thank you so much to Aiden Manning and the entire team, team at Upfire Digital for editing our podcast. And make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube to watch these videos now. You can see Leia. You can see weird hand movements, our high fives that we do across the screen Dink. very poorly. Dink. Dink. Um, we're just so off right now. <laughs> we can't do it at the same time. It's okay. We're just touching hands. Fine. That's good. Yes. We'll just do our little triangle thing. Our world domination. Just symbol Casual until world someone domination emails us and over says here. That they are mad that we do this and then we'll probably stop. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, come join us for world domination. See you next week. You know, you we know will the things. See you. See you on the other, other side. side.